tell you I've been here just a few hours since yesterday, but every single second has been just an incredible source of joy, inspiration, just to see as many beautiful people committing to making the reign of God a reality. And I think that's just a beautiful title of your, of your conference, of your organization, Christian Communities for Development. That's really what Christian communities are about. That's really the, the origins of the church was precisely that. Uh, it was Christian communities that knew they could live an alternative, that knew they could live something different in the midst of incredibly oppressing forces. And then to see your title up here, Cities of Love with Liberty and Justice for All, reminded me immediately of the eschatological city of the book of Revelations, the final chapter, where the city becomes a city with a river of clear floating water, with fruit trees that give abundant fruit 12 times a year, so there'll be plenty for everyone, no poverty, no mystery, where their leaves will be medicinal, so there'll be no sickness, no need for prescription drugs or anything else, where well, there'll be no more suffering, no more pain. And so this is your Logan. And yet, our world today, all creation groans and travails waiting for that renewal. And you and I know, you and I know how much pain there's in the world, how much destructive there's in the world. It's painful to see, not just international terror, but terror in our streets, in our high schools. Just yesterday, a couple of high schools had killings. It, it's terrible to see how the world is self-destructing. And yet to see communities of hope, communities that don't give up, communities say, we're going to do something because God entrusted the world to our care. It's so beautiful to see what God entrusted to us and yet what are we doing with it? I myself, you're talking about being with the poor, I was born poor. My parents were immigrants from Mexico. They both came under a very difficult situation. Uh, they started a very small family business in San Antonio. I worked at it. I grew up there. We never knew we were poor, but looking back now, I know we were, but we're rich in our faith. We reached our faith because we knew that God was with us. And we knew that God was listening to us. And my introduction to prayer was my father. We had a grocery store. It was right close to the Catholic Church. And, you know, if you've ever been in San Antonio, you know the heat of San Antonio. We had over 30 days of over 100 de degree weather this summer. So a lot of people would walk by the store and go to church to pray. And they'd come back and they'd stop to buy a 7-Up or some kind of soda or something. And my dad used to say, you know... You know, son, mijo, he's called, that's the way, oh yeah, mijo, you know, son, I really feel sorry for God. I feel so sorry for God. There he is, hanging on a crucifix, you know, suffering like anything, and all day long, people come to him, throwing big problems at him. You know, I mean, he's already suffering enough, and yet people come with all kinds of problems and agony and tears. He said, you know, if God is really God, if God is really God, God must enjoy a good time. So my dad's prayer consisted at the end of the day, we had a big picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in our living room, going and standing in front of that picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and telling Jesus the best jokes he had heard that day. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that was my first introduction to God. It was my first introduction to God, a God who suffers with us on the cross, but who doesn't let that suffer and destroy his life. He rises, he's the risen Lord. And he, and he doesn't allow suffering to destroy life, but rises above suffering. And today we saw that in here. I saw that in here. I saw people who know the problems of the world, know the suffering, do something and rising above it. So I was raised in poverty. I've been a priest now 41 years. No, I'm sorry, 43 years. They go too fast. Uh, every one of my years I've been working with, amongst the poor. But not, not to maintain them in poverty. The scriptures never say, blessed is poverty. They say, blessed is the poor. Uh, and it's a big difference in the two. Because today, I think we often confuse, we often hear this confusion of this so-called gospel of prosperity, but it's really the gospel of selfish prosperity. Because God doesn't want people to stay in poverty. You know what poverty is. I've worked it all my life. I mean, poverty is misery. Poverty is lack. Po poverty smells bad. People don't have the soap to bathe. Uh, poverty is not something we wish on anyone. But the poor, the poor, are blessed by God. Why? It took me a long time to understand that. For a long time, I really could understand why the poor are God's blessed. Until I started to understand that the poor are poor, not because they don't want to work, not because they're lazy, not because they're not intelligent, not because they cannot do it. All the stereotypes 
that those who maintain him poor and those who to get rich at the cost of the poor will create to justify the exploitation and the unjust treatment of those that are making them rich. The scriptures are full. The prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, they're full of the critique of those who become rich at the cost of destroying the poor, the weak, the ones that get exploited. And so I realized that poverty was not an accident, that poverty in a way came through the structures of society. And I started to realize that, that poverty, that poverty had even caused sometimes the poor to begin to believe what society said about us, that we're unworthy, that we couldn't make it, that we're lazy, that we're irresponsible. You know all the labels. You know all the labels are placed, and pretty soon you begin to believe them. I believe the worst, the worst sin of oppression is you begin to believe the lies of society about who you are. And there's no worse enslavement than believing you can't do it. Uh, that is what holds you back. Uh, once somebody is free to know they can do it, it's amazing. I've worked in community organization for many years now, and I really think it's one of the great gifts of our, of our age, community organizing for the better of the whole. And I've seen people resurrect through community organizing. I remember many stories, but I'll share at least one with you. This is my favorite one. And we're having a community organizing advance somewhat in San Antonio, and we're having an accountability night with the people running for mayor of San Antonio. And we had a big crowd, almost as big as this, of all kinds of barrio people, of all kinds of poor people, African Americans, Mexican Americans, poor white people that were there. And the candidates were given all kinds of political type answers. And one of the candidates, actually the mayor who ran for re-election, was given a very complicated answer about why they had never worked on the flooding in San Antonio and why more people were dying in San Antonio because of flooding that never died in the swimming pools or near rivers. And it was all, of course, in the poor sections of town. Well, the mayor was given a really twisted around answer. The yes, he was in favor, however, notwithstanding, because that other guy went over the place. But pretty soon, this elderly lady, kind of humped over with a little stick, you know, hair all over the place, he, she kind of walks up and she taps on the microphone <laughs> with her little cane. And she says in very broken English, she could hardly speak English, but she said, uh, Mr. Mayor, I am a simple, dumb, clean-up woman. I don't understand what you're trying to say. I have no idea what you're trying to say. I simply want to know, are you going to vote yes or no on the issue? <laughs> My dear friends, that was the question of the evening. Now notice what happened. This lady was no longer enslaved. She was no longer in the tomb of being uneducated of not being able to speak correctly, of not having any dignity or status. Or, she no longer was in the tomb that held her back. She broke out of the tomb and she arose and she walked and she spoke the word of life. That's what community organizing can do for people. And that's what I've experienced. That's what I've experienced. There's tremendous talent there. And it's for the role of the church to, to release that talent and to, you know, to bring it to organization so it can move out and bring about new life for people. But in looking, in searching myself, as a pastor, as a theologian, what is the root of this suffering? What is the root of this suffering that causes so much suffering and poverty and misery, not just in the United States, but throughout the world? You know the poverty. You know the poverty in places where people only make $3 a day. You know the poverty in our own country, of the millions that go to bed hungry at night. You know the poverty in many of our American sister states, Haiti, one of the poorest areas in the world, Honduras, one of the poorest areas in the world, Mexico, because of the NAFTA agreements, Many, many more people have become unemployed now. Before they had at least a little bit, now they have nothing. And so you find this growing mystery in the world. What is the cause of this? And I started to look at the scriptures. I started to look at the scriptures and I was fascinated. I was fascinated with what I discovered in the scriptures. First of all, that the God of creation, the God of creation created men and women to God's own likeness. Uh, and he didn't create white, black, brown, Japanese, Mexican, the human. It is a human that is the image and likeness of God. It is a human that is the image and likeness of the creating God, who out of chaos brings order and harmony. And so we are to the image and likeness of God when we're using our creativity, our creativity to bring about newness out of the chaos of the moment. This is where we're most God-like. But very quickly we see in the scriptures that creation was corrupt. And I'll summarize it very quickly. We always say that the first sin of Adam was disobedience. I believe the real sin, the real sin behind it is obedience much deeper. 
I think, first of all, Adam and Eve lived in paradise. I mean, the image of everything that you need. You need nothing more. But did they ever say thank you to God? If they did, we don't know it from the scripture. We don't know that they were grateful for what they had. But what happened to them? They were not only not grateful, they were obsessed. They were obsessed with, with having what they did not need, but they did not have. Because they felt only by obtaining what they did not need, but yet did not have, even though they had everything they needed, could they become like gods. And that, I think, is the first perversion. The first perversion of society is when there's no gratitude in our hearts for who we are, for what we receive. I've learned so much from poor people that can often tell you, Hito, gracias a Dios, es tan bueno. Son, God is so good to us. They appreciate the goodness of God. I visited with people coming across the deserts in Arizona. One lady, I'll never forget, had blisters in her feet, blister upon blister in her feet. Her temperature was way high. She was almost baked like a lobster. And they take her into a hospital, not visiting with her. And she barely looked at me and said, well, what would you say to God? Thank you, God. Thank you for being so gracious to me that you walk with me across the desert. Thank you. It was her first words. Adam and Eve didn't say that. Uh, they were obsessed. And I think this is the first perversion. The first perversion is that we begin to see, unless we have more, we're not satisfied. I had a friend of mine from Europe recently, recently visited the United States. And as he left, I said, what's your image of, this, of us? And he had a lot of good things to say. But one in particular I thought was very interesting. Well, I said, you know, the image that I take of people in the United States is that you go shopping when you don't need anything, to buy things you don't need, with money you don't have, to store them away in rental space you don't own. <laughs> I said, you know, I never thought about that. But that's in many ways us. I mean, in the neighborhood where I work, more and more of these portable storage houses are going up. Uh, but the first thing is that to think that you can only be fully human when you have more, uh, and therefore never being satisfied. Have you ever found a rich person that's already satisfied with what they have? Most of the time, the more they have, the more they want. Uh, and then what happens is you, get, you begin to get it any way you can. So you begin to exploit people, to rob people illegally, one way or the other. Look at the big capitals. How many people have had to suffer for those great capitals to come about? So the first sin, the first perversion, to think that you're only fully human when you can have more. But the second perversion, Cain and Abel. Cain was not satisfied who he was. Go back later on today. Look at your Bible, chapter 4. When Abel, when Cain is thinking about what he's going to do, and God speaks to him beautifully, beautiful words of a father. He says, look, don't worry about your brother. Do what you're going to do and do it right and hold your head up. Huh? In other words, don't compare. Don't compare. Be yourself and be the best possible you you can be. But don't compare yourself to others because you're not somebody else. And therefore, the roots of the second sin, jealousy, that I have to be better than you to be someone. And how often myself, I fall into a trap in pastoral ministry. Sometimes I'm visiting the hospital, and I see somebody that's really bad off. They were in an accident or something. And I try to cheer him up a bit. He said, well, don't feel so bad. You don't see the poor fellow in the other room. They're really bad off. So sometimes you feel that to make somebody feel good, you've got to make somebody be below them. And I think that's the second root. And that's the second root of jealousy. And that's the root of racism, ethnocentrism, sexism, so many things. You have to have somebody lesser than you to feel that you're okay. Otherwise, you're not fully human. And then when those are institutionalized, you have the Tower of Babel. When now, rather than we being created through the image and likeness of God, we create God to our own perverted image and likeness. St. Paul. Go back to St. Paul tonight, read the first three chapters of St. Paul, especially chapter 3. It was impossible that we've corrupted the image of God. And if we've corrupted the image of God, we have corrupted the image of the human who is made to the image and likeness of God. So if we corrupt one, we corrupt the other. Uh, and so we think that to be human, we have to be better than anybody else, we have to be richer than anybody else, we have to be above everybody else, and we set everybody against everybody else, the roots of war, of jealousies, of tragedies. But into this world of sin, into the world of St. Paul in chapter 3 says, there's not one good one left. So the tongue speaks evil, immorality, injustice, perversion. There's not one good one left. Into this world, God so loved the world. And this is what I'd like to zero in tonight, the positive part. But I had to set the stage because the story of Jesus doesn't make sense unless you appreciate the biblical view of humanity perverted by sin. 
are twisted images, values, hierarchies of thought of being. And so therefore, at the root of evil is that sin of the world that St. John speaks about so powerfully. The sin that blinds us, the sin that corrupts our value system, the sin that corrupts our way of judging. That is another world. But God so loved the world that it starts with his people. He started preparing the way, preparing the way the Apiru, the Hebrew people, the nobodies of society, become God's chosen people. Why? Because God begins to reveal the light of the world. And so in the fullness of time, as St. Paul tells so beautifully, in the fullness of time, God became one of us. God did not just come close to us. God did not just use prophets to, to, to speak for God. God became one of us. And St. Paul speaks so beautifully in that ancient Christian hymn that became one of the early creeds of the Christian community in Philippians 2.6. That he who is by nature of divine condition doesn't, doesn't cling to this, doesn't hold on to this, but he empties himself and takes the form of man, even becoming a slave, even becoming a subhuman. The emptiness of God. Yet God lays behind all privilege, all status, all security to enter humanity at the lowest point of what humanity has made of his fellow human beings. And, and St. Paul speaks loudly of this. But then we find also in, say, in the Acts of the Apostles, one of the first sermons of Peter in Acts 2, or rather in Acts 4, where Peter says, the stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. The powerful text. The builders of empires of wealth and power and domination and exploitation and enslavement. The builders of empires, the stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. The one that society say are the nothing has become the cornerstone. It's no wonder when we look at the life of Jesus that St. Paul would say so loudly, only in the power of the Spirit would you dare to say that Jesus is Lord. Because when we look humanly speaking, when we look humanly speaking of the human being that God became, only in the power of the Spirit do we dare to confess that Jesus is Lord. And so what I can do this evening with you very quickly, very quickly, just look at that emptiness of God. That emptiness of, and why what appears to be disaster news is the beginning of the good news. And why it is the beginning of our human liberation. Why is the beginning of the redemption of the world and of humanity. That emptying of God that begins a new way for all of us. When God becomes human, God becomes not just any human being. God becomes a very particular human being conditioned by the stereotypes of his time, by the thinking of his time, by the values of his time. And so it is no, it's no wonder that the first c command of the resurrected Lord, the first mandate of the resurrected Lord is go to Galilee and there you will see me. Beautiful text. Go to Galilee. And St. Luke, it doesn't, never sends Jesus back or anybody back. It makes us sure that the ones that speak on Pentecost morning are Galileans that are speaking in a way that I can understand. Why is it so important? Because I think here God begins to in a way invert the original inversion of the world, where God begins to invert to bring out that the true value of the human is precisely that you're human. Not the categories you put around it, not the titles, but the fact that you're human. And that is the basic dignity of the human being, that we are made to God's image and likeness. And so we'll go to Galilee, because when God becomes human, he begins in Galilee. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Galilee. I became fascinated with Galilee as I was searching. So I was starting to get to know Jesus better. And I wondered why, if Galilee had no importance at all in the Old Testament, why would it become such a focal point, such a fundamental point to beginning in the New Testament? Why would it become just a crucial notion that it constantly comes through? Galilee, Galileans, men of Galilee, Jesus of Galilee, and so forth. Well, I started to discover that Galilee was a very interesting place. I remember one book that I read, and I love this quote, said, Galilee was the center of nowhere. It was the crossroads to everywhere. Galilee was not an important political capital. It was not Rome. It was not an important intellectual capital. It was not Athens or Greece. It was not an important religious capital. It was not Jerusalem. It was nobody's land. And in some way, in some way, an eschatological land, geographically a beautiful land. But it had been a land of multiple conquests. It had been a, a land of multiple invasions and exiles. It had been a land where the, where the people of God had suffered oppression and domination. And so we begin to see the descent of God. Look quickly what God began. 
God becomes not any man, but a particular man, a very well-defined particular man. He becomes a Jew. And who were the Jews according to the world? Despised. I mean, look what happened not too many years ago in Germany. And almost all the nations of the world collaborated. If you've never visited one of the death camps in Germany, I suggest you try to do it sometime. It's a very, very painful experience to see what we as human beings did. Because it was Western humanity in many ways that sent millions, millions to the ovens for the simple fact of being Jew. I mean, the Jewish people had suffered consistently. God becomes a Jew. But it often happens, unfortunately. Unfortunately, one of the great consequences of being an oppressed people is that you begin to look for others to oppress so that you can feel okay. It happens to all of us. You begin to, if somebody's stepping on you, you try to find someone you can step on so you can feel better. So the Jewish people themselves had their categories to put down. And one of those was Galileans. The Jews did not like the Galilean Jews because they live out in the periphery. They live out in the hinterland. They're, they're constantly in contact with the pagans, with the Gentiles. And you know what it meant, an impurity for the Jewish people. They're constantly in contact with other civilizations and languages. So it's a land of mixture. It's a land of mixture. So that the Galileans are considered to be impure. They're considered to be public sinners because they're considered that they did not know the law and could not keep the law. So God becomes Jew, Galilean, and the ultimate put down in a way, son of Mary. Today, we as Christians, we glorify ourselves in the virginity of Mary, the mother of Jesus. But put yourself, put yourself at that position, that time. An event that happened, this young maiden becomes pregnant. And we know it's Christianity of the Holy Spirit. But you take a young lady, becomes pregnant, goes to a beautiful prayer meeting like tonight, and goes back home and tells her daddy or mommy, Mommy, guess what? I'm pregnant. But don't worry. It was the Holy Spirit. It happened tonight during the song fest. You, know? you see? That's the reaction. You know, God becomes the son of an unwed mother. But look at the descent. Jew, Galilean, son of Mary. Why is this what appears to be a story of disaster at the beginning of the good news? Because God wants to break through. He wants to break through all the categories, all the categories that we make, that we create, to destroy the fundamental dignity and value of a human being. When God becomes human, is a human as human, the babe in the crib that reveals the glory of God. Why would God begin through Mary that way? Because in a way, Mary wanted to reaffirm and enter in solidarity with women who have been victimized and then destroyed and crushed. How often, how often one of the great pains, and I'm sure many of you have worked with women that have been victimized, the pain, the feeling of impurity, the feeling of being soiled, they feel they cannot do anything. And yet in Mary, it seems to me that God reveals, God reveals that nobody can take what only you can give away. That virginity cannot be taken, it can only be given. And that God protects, that God protects, happen what may happen, God protects. And so virginity is about the restoration of a ruined reputation. Uh, that Mary and Jesus, what happens to a kid that's born, that's born in, in, in this way? Society labels that kid. And you know how awful it is. Which one of us? Which one of us chose the way we were born? None of us. But life is a gift. Life is a gift. And so God here destroys, destroys all those categories, even, even the, the, the one of how we are conceived, because that's the ultimate one. He destroys all those categories, and then a child, Jesus, in the crib, with no place to live, because the city would not accept him. There, the glory of God begins to be revealed. The glory of God, that no matter who you are, no matter what society says about you, you are the glory of God. And here it begins. Here it begins, and of course, it continues. The process continues. Who knows what Jesus did? I'm sure Jesus suffered as a kid. I'm sure he suffered a lot of the gospel that went around him. I don't even know if he lived in small towns. I worked in small towns for a while. You know, everybody knows everything. And you have to live with what your cousins say about you. You have to live with what the neighbors say about you. You may hate it, but you have to live with it. I'm sure many things were said about Jesus. You know, being brought up in Galilee, he couldn't even speak correctly. I mean, as a... As a Mexican American from Texas, where not a time you don't speak any language correctly, English or Spanish or you name it, you know. Uh, and so I really identify with Galilean talk, because you know the Galileans had such a funny way of speaking that in many of the synagogues, the Galileans were prohibited from reading the scriptures in public because it was considered to be an insult to the word of God. And you remember, poor Peter, 
He could deny Jesus, but he couldn't deny he was a Galilean. Because the moment he spoke, he said, uh-huh, we know who you are. You open your mouth, you know, that's what happens to us many times in Texas. Hey, man, what do you want to speak, you know? Because you want to hear the way we speak? Say, mira, I'll take you out as four, and then we'll go have lunch. But I don't know what you're going to do, but as he cares, well, we'll see if you can have a little fun time together. But, you know, that's Texan talk. You know, that's Texan talk. And in a way, that was kind of Galilean talk. You know, that was kind of Galilean talk. So, so I mean, this, this was Jesus. He suffered all those things. But now, now, and I think it's a crucial moment. It was for me and for all of us, I think. Jesus goes through an incredible moment at the baptism. And in a way, he drowns. We always speak about conversion to Jesus. I like to begin by the conversion of Jesus. But so Jesus was, you know, he converted. We don't know anything about his boyhood. We don't know anything about what he did as a young man, but he probably worked as an ordinary worker. He probably suffered all the things that people suffer, because God assumed our suffering. St. Paul tells us in the epistle to the Hebrews that we have a high priest because he went through everything we go through. So we can't say Jesus didn't understand us. Jesus didn't go through that. Uh, so Jesus the Baptist, he drowns all those negative images about himself he might have had. He drowns all those dehabilitating sense of being a victim of society and being this and then the other. He drowns that in his baptism. He comes out of the water. And what does he hear? In other words, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. My dear friends, when we go through a true conversion experience to Jesus, as he went himself, and we can really stand up and say, this is who I am. I'm not going to apologize to it. I'm not going to be arrogant about it. But this is who I am. I mean, I'm an excellent American. I don't feel better than anybody else. I don't feel worse than anybody else. But I have to be able to rise above all the pain and say, well, they don't understand me. They don't like me. They're against me. Da, da, da. Say, this is who I am. And God loves me. And if God loves me, if I really experience the love of God, there is nothing more liberating, nothing more empowering than to get up and say, to have heard the words, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. I've experienced this in, in working with groups. Once people experience that love of God in their heart, that no matter who says what about them, they are someone they can say, I am, as the Lord say, I am. That's the beginning. And what does the Lord do after that conversion? He comes out now and is an incredible visionary. I come to preach good news to the poor, salvation, liberation. And he begins to preach in a way that nobody has heard before. But more than his preaching, more than his preaching, Jesus did actions. Jesus, in a way, created, he didn't just speak about the reign of God, uh, where everybody's invited. He created a new space. And this is what Christian communities are about, creating those new spaces in the midst of corrupting empires. Uh, Jesus created a new space by enjoying table fellowship with anyone and everyone. There's a theologian, American Baptist, Norman Perrin, unfortunately died quite young, but he had a real little book, if you can find it, I recommend it to you highly. It was called Rediscovering the Teaching of Jesus. And he said the most revolutionary, the most astounding thing that Jesus did, the craziest thing that Jesus did, the most daring thing that Jesus did, that probably sent him to the cross the fastest was his willingness and ability to have a good time with anyone and everyone. And in that, he scandalized everyone because he refused to be scandalized by anyone. My dear friends, that is the beginning of a new space. Look what Jesus reached out to and brought into his company. I remember when I was first assigned to work in the cathedral in San Antonio, downtown San Antonio. I've been in San Antonio all my life. But I never knew we had so much prostitution in San Antonio. And, and I just didn't know it. But I was assigned to the cathedral right downtown. And I started to meet many of the people who, who worked in this profession, as they told me. It was a profession. And, you know, and one time I, I got finished with the early mass. We used to have mass at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I got through with the early mass. It was winter time. And I walked out of the church and I saw one of the persons who had just finished their night work. And I said, you want to have breakfast with me? I said, sure, Father, I'll have breakfast. So we walked down to this 24-hour restaurant about a block down. They all knew me. I went there pretty often. And I walked in with this person to have breakfast. And pretty, right away, one of the waiters called me over and says, Father, could I talk to you? Sure. I thought he had a family problem or something else. He says, um, Father, do you know who that person is you're having breakfast with? I mean, he knew that person was a night walker. And he was scandalized. I said, yeah, I know who it is. I know where they work at. He said, you're having breakfast with them? Well, yeah, of course. They're human. But he was scandalized that I would have breakfast with a prostitute. 
Oh, my dear friends, if you listen to stories of prostitutes, you know why they were so dear to Jesus. Almost every one of them has incredible stories of pain and brokenness and destruction and abuse. I mean, they're not the ugly people sometimes we make them to be. They're people in great pain, and they need love. They need love. They need that outrage. I could tell stories of conversion of prostitutes, but again, I'm running out of time. So the space, I think, is crucial to us in Christianity. Jesus did not just preach beautifully. This is not just great miracles. He created a new space, and that was the reign of God. The reign of God where people would enter in, and there would no longer be a prostitute, a tax collector, and this and that. It would be Mary, John, Peter, Simon. You would be someone. Huh? You would be someone in this community. And it was a community of caring for each other. Because that's what Jesus brought them into, to be concerned and to be caring for each other. So because of this, Jesus stirred things up. I kind of rushed through. And that was the mission of Jesus, to initiate a reign of God, to assume our human suffering, so that his mission would be to work, to create a space, so that nobody would have to suffer what he had suffered. That's the point of departure for mission, uh, that nobody will have to suffer what we have suffered because we bring about and create something new for them. And let their talents come forth and shine forth. Well, Jesus pretty soon goes to the cross. But he doesn't just go to the cross, he confronts. He confront those structures that keep people from recognizing their true value and dignity. And it's amazing when he goes to Jerusalem and confronts the temple, pulls together, pulls together two, two, two prophetic oracles, one from Isaiah, my house is a house of prayer for all the peoples of the world. My dear friends, that is the true church. The true church is that space where everyone will be welcome. That church is a place where nobody will feel out of place. That's the true church. When the temple becomes a source of segregation and separation, then it has become perverted. The temple, precisely the living temple, is that space where everybody will be welcome. But what makes that separation many times? Jesus interprets one prophetic oracle or another one, Jeremiah chapter 7. But you have made it a den of thieves. My dear friends, there's nothing worse than religion that becomes perverted. Perverted because it welcomes... It welcomes the unjust sinners that abuse the poor and keeps those that have broken their backs and given their blood even when come to church because they don't have the proper clothing, they don't have the proper dress. That is Jeremiah, where Jeremiah just ties in the people who have perverted religion and let those who exploit appear as the saints of society while allowing the victims to appear as public victims of society. That is a perversion of religion itself. And Jesus confronts that. Because religion is to be a source of, of encountering God, not an obstacle to God. Uh, and if God is the Father of all, then how can we not be brothers to each other? That is the radicalness of Jesus. Oh, that is a beautiful community of Jesus. That if we really confess God to be our Father, and we say in our prayer, Our Father, uh, the God who makes the sun to rise and fall upon everyone, how can we deny anyone? And our dream is to make our hemisphere precisely that temple of the Holy Spirit that Jesus speaks about. But Jesus is condemned to death because he, he, sh he shook the structures that maintained separation, that maintained and, and legitimized it. Uh, and he, began, he begins to challenge those structures. Uh, and for that he goes to the cross. Uh, dear friends, the message from the cross is probably the most powerful, the most powerful, beautiful message in all the Gospels. Uh, go to it yourselves. The very first words of Jesus the very first words, here he's done nothing but do good for people. He said he was born a reject, he rejected rejection, now he ends up being rejected by everyone. But what are his words from the cross? Father, forgive them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. My dear friends, I remember a speaker many years ago made a deep impact in me. He said, you'll never be free until you can take a gift to the person that has offended you. Otherwise, you're enslaved to that person. Forgiveness is the only entry into freedom. And forgiveness doesn't mean that you say it didn't hurt, or everything was right, everything was okay, but you don't let the hurt dominate you. You don't let the hurt enslave you. You don't have, let the hurt paralyze you. And so Jesus on the cross, Father, forgiveness. Uh, and he goes on into, the, into your hands, I command my spirit. And the way he dies, we hear the first confession of faith. Uh, truly, this was the Son of God. My dear friends, the cross is powerful. Because Jesus loved us and introduced a way of love that would create new spaces of belonging. And even when everybody rejected him and cursed him out and insulted him and scourged him, we could not force him to stop loving us. That is the power of the cross. 
that we love no matter condition, no matter circumstances, and we don't let anything stop, stop us from loving. But my dear friends, we know it doesn't end with the cross. We don't end with the cross because the one whom the world crucified, God resurrected. And that was a triumph of love over evil. That was a triumph of God who brings out a new image of humanity. And that was the beginning of the resurrected community. And that is what we're about today. We're part of the continuity of the resurrection community who constantly goes back to Galilee to rewalk the road of our Savior so we can be that resurrected community in the world today. And the resurrected community which immediately started to break down all the, all the categories of separation, all the barriers, and all of a sudden it didn't count who you were before. In the new community, you are a brother and a sister. There's no greater title that any of us can have than my brother and my sister if we recognize that God is our Father. And so we have the early community immediately be begins to break barriers. Go to the Acts of the Apostles, uh, and you'll see how quickly all the barriers are broken. But what was this Christian community? Four points. Four points, and they were marvelous. They came to pray together. They knew they couldn't do it alone. They could only do it in the power of the Spirit. So the first thing was prayer. Lord, guide us. Lord, give us the strength. Give us the wisdom. Give us the understanding. The first thing was wisdom, prayer. Second, to study the teachings of the Apostles. We never understand fully the mystery of Christ. My dear friends, it's so beautiful that it makes sense even to a young child. It's so profound that greatest intellectuals have not exhausting the learning about it. The mystery of Christ, which is the mystery of God that is unlimited love, that is the mystery of St. Paul says, ear has not heard, eye has not seen, nor he has answered the imagination, the things that God prepares for us. The mystery of God, the mystery of Jesus. So the constant study, we're never complete, we're never finished. Uh, Third, concern for each other and for those beyond. This is the basic of the Christian community, is concern for each other. Uh, not just prayer and singing. Yes, we need that. That's beautiful. But that should energize us. That should energize us to want to do more, to always want to do more, to be grateful for what we have done but never satisfied. Say, I can do more. Thank you, Lord, for what I've done, but I know I can do more. I know we can do more together. I know we're setting our vision too small. When the original building of Notre Dame uh, was burned down many, many years ago. The founder, the found, they thought the founder was going to be very, very concerned and upset everything about the building burning down. He, he was away on some trip. And in those days, you didn't have any communications. It was the 1800s. When he got back, his immediate reaction was, well, I'll be. He said, you know what? God was telling us we had been thinking too small. God wanted a bigger building. Well, let's get to work, you know. Instead of being upset, he praised God and thanked God and said, let's move. And, you know, that's us. Something doesn't work out right. That's it. God wants to do it even better. We don't stop. We keep moving because we're working in the Lord. For the Lord, there's not just word as failure. There's just opportunities for new beginning. And so something happened, doesn't work. Let's try again. Let's go again. We'll find it. That was a Christian community. But the fourth, the fourth point was they broke bread together. They celebrated together. Uh, celebration is an essential part of, of Christian tradition. And you've had it here. I mean, the real celebration and the joy in the Lord, that's energizing. That's not pumping fuel into us. We have the joy. That's the greatest energy to go and keep doing it. The Christian community broke all barriers and introduced a new way of knowledge, a new way of understanding, a new vision into the world. Introduced what I call the fundamental hyphenated existence. To be a Christian is to be a hyphenated person. What I say is because nobody stopped being who they were but they now were who they were in a radically new way. The Jews didn't stop being Jews, those that converted to Christianity, but they were Jews in a radically new way. The Greeks didn't stop being Greeks, but they were, re they were Greeks in a radically new way. Christianity affirmed their identity, but opened doors to their exclusiveness. So they could really interact with what, that's how Christianity became universal. They didn't have a common language, but they did have the language of universal love. And my dear friends, I think today, I think today we are called, we are the resurrected community. We are called to build that new humanity. That's our mission that's been instructed to us today. We are the resurrected poor. We need to stay with the poor because Jesus showed us that it's not we who save the poor, but the poor who save us. Uh, the poor are the, they are the, what we call in the portavoces de Dios. They are the carriers because they're the ones that have, the only one that can trust is in God. But the God who calls them to be someone to be someone to come out of their enslavement, to come out of their poverty, to come out, out of their status of, uh, that it's not important, they're not important enough, to come out of that and to do something. It's the resurrected poor who are going to create the alternatives that are going to be hope to everyone. Peace will not come through the weapons of war.
Peace will not come to just technology or other things. They'll help. Technology will help. But technology doesn't have the soul. And my dear friends, it's that soul of people that dare to believe that thing, they, things can be better because God has called me and God has called you and God has called us. And together, we can be the community of the resurrected Lord who we thank God for who we are in humility, not arrogance. We thank God for who we are, thank God for who each other is. And we work together that out of our suffering, we may work so no one will ever have to suffer what we have suffered in the past. And that is the greatest gift we can give to the next generation, that we have taken what we have received and we transform into something better so we continue the building of the reign of God, those spaces, those privileged spaces where everyone, regardless of who they are, will come together and experience the love of God and the love of one another. This is the alternative that we have. This is what Jesus empowers us to do. The Jesus that empowers us to build that city. That city that will have no limits. That city will have no bounds. I have a dream. I have a beautiful dream that I know I will never see in my lifetime. But I hope it will come someday. I have a dream that someday we have a hemisphere without borders. The Sunday Hemisphere, where all the peoples can go back and forth and find work and dignity and position, I don't know it's going to be done. I don't expect to see it in my lifetime. But I have a dream that the prophets of old had a dream that a child could play with a cobra and the lamb could sleep with the lion. I have a dream that sometime we could really have a new land where segregation will not be around, where people be who they are and celebrate their beauty, celebrate their dignity, celebrate one another, and have that beautiful joy that we experience tonight in this dancing group of all kinds of people that that be symbolic of what our hemisphere can be. I know I will not see it in my lifetime, but I dream that someday we'll be there where nobody will have to suffer anymore because we will all enjoy the home that God prepares for all that love God. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for the joy. Thank you for who you are. God bless you.